Uh, let's see. We've been doing this since last May. Yeah, late, late May, or last June, I think it was. <clears throat> and, uh, man, I can't believe how many people chime in, tune in, ask all these questions. So, oh, I got to turn off my computer here. We're going to get a, an echo and feedback. So, uh, we're going to start talking today about scouting. And once we get through a bit of the details here, there's a reason why we're going to talk about scouting. Is today New Mexico came out with their draw results. I think next Monday or Tuesday, Montana is going to come out with their draw results. Wyoming and Arizona already have put out their draw results. And in May, we're going to get Utah and Colorado and Nevada. So now we're going to shift. We're going to start talking about some of this scouting stuff we do. The desk scouting, the e, what I call e-scouting, and uh, get to all that. But a couple points of business here. We passed the Nevada deadline on Monday, so if you missed it, too bad. The next deadline is Oregon, May 15th, and then after that is Idaho, June 1st, for deer, elk, and antelope. Now, since this is called Elk Doc Live, we're not focusing on sheep and other stuff, but sheep and moose and goat in Montana and Idaho, you're going to want to be in by, I think, April 30th or May 1st. Check that out. So... Uh, if you want to win a bow, here's what you should do. Go to bowtecharchery.com and you'll see this big banner on the top and a big banner on the bottom that says win a bow of your choice right here. Go there and win a bow. But don't go do it now. Keep watching this. Uh, <clears throat> so, this is brought to you by Bowtech, by Leupold, by Onyx Maps, by Tight Spot Quivers, by Black Gold Sites, Ripcord Arrow Rest, uh, GoHunt.com, and Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. And I think Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls, celebrating that Nevada, or New Mexico issued their uh, tag results today, Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls is going to randomly pick some people and give them a Black Magic Diaphragm call today. So if you post and an ask a question, you're going to get that. GoHunt.com, remember we've been talking about them. It's a service we use for all of our applications. Use promo code Randy and you're going to get $50 of great, uh, like mad money. Yeah, cash. In their gear shop, uh, if you sign up for their Insider. And Onyx Maps, because we're going to start talking a lot more about Onyx. OnyxMaps.com, if you go out there and buy any of their app products, they're going to give you 20% off if you use promo code Randy out there. Whoo, somebody said, some guy said he just today drew a New Mexico elk 16D second hunt. Holy moly. Wow. How cool is that? You know how many times I've applied for 16D in my life and I've never drawn? Hmm. Oh, well. That's the way it goes. All right. So... Here, we're going to talk about some of these things related to scouting, and hopefully that'll get us into the questions that I'm, I'm wanting to touch on. Because one of the things that's been happening is we keep getting asked the same questions, and some of them are pretty superficial questions or really vague questions. And some of the listeners, some of the viewers have said, can you get into some different questions? Don't answer the same question every other week. So we're trying to spread it around. Try to think about questions that maybe you haven't heard us talk about before, and there's a greater likelihood we'll grab that one. But when it comes to my scouting, here's how I do it. I operate under the theory that to tag an elk, you got to find an elk. And I know that sounds really simplistic, but the number one reason that people don't fill their elk tag is they've not put in the homework, the research, the, research, the study, the understanding of elk behavior, so that they can find them consistently. Once you find elk, especially in the rifle seasons, I think they're easier to put your tag on than a deer. Elk, yeah, I mean, archery season, elk, deer, it's just tough in archery season, but consistently finding elk is where most people fail. And when we get to that, when we go to all this scouting stuff I'm going to talk about, it's predicated on four basic needs and five season types. The four basic needs are food, water, sanctuary, and the seasonal need of breeding. 
and you've heard me say it many times, but I, I, the reason I say it all the time is this is how you plan. This is how you scout. This is how you consistently find elk. You have to look at which seasons are you hunting. Are you hunting in the early season, which I say is any time in August? Are you hunting the pre-rut, which I lucked out and drew New Mexico archery elk today, but I'm going to be hunting mostly the pre-rut because the season is September 1st to the 14th. Yeah, it'll just be transitioning to peak rut, which is the next season. Peak rut is whenever it really fires up in your area, I say usually from September 10th to about October 4th to, to 8th, somewhere in there. And then it transitions to the post rut, which is all those other dates in October. And then November, December, those are the last phase we talk about, the late season. And you might be saying, well, why does that matter? Here's why it matters. Because these four needs I talk about, they might be in order of food, water, security, in whatever season, say early season. But by the late season of December, those might be flipped exactly upside down where the primary need is security, then water, then food. And elk go across the landscape wherever they can best satisfy that need of food, water, sanctuary, or breeding. They move large, large distances. And they can make a living in a very small place if they have to. So that's why you have to know what is the need in the season that you're going to be hunting. So let's, I'm going to use my example, this New Mexico archery elk tag I have. Okay, I said it's pre-rut, transitioning somewhere to peak rut. On September 1st, the primary need is going to be food and water. And as it gets closer to peak rut, the breeding need is going to climb from probably really not even in their mind at the end of August to by the end of my hunt, the breeding need is going to be the number one need they have. So you'll see just even in a two week period of my season, breeding goes from being eh, so so to the number one need. Well, what does that tell you? That tells you if it's the number one need, where do they go to satisfy that number one need? All right, September 1st their number one need is going to probably be food or water. Since it's New Mexico, I'm going with water. Let's say the monsoon season's been bad. I'm going that water is the number one need. All right, now I know where to start looking, where to do my e-scouting. What am I going to do? What, wh how am I gonna prioritize these areas I have? Because my map is this big. I need to get it down to a place this big. All right. Then as the season progresses, the need of breeding keeps moving up. Okay, it's more important than sanctuary. A couple days later, it's more important than food. A couple days later, it's more important than water even. All right, breeding. Where am I going to go to find bull elk when the rut is on towards the end of my hunt, say September 12th? Well, I'm going to go where there are cows. Where am I going to find cows? Cows always have two needs. Food and water, food and water, food and water. So I'm going to go and look, where's the best food on the landscape? They're grazers, so I'm looking for grasses, mostly, with water nearby. Because if I find those cows, I know that by September 10th, that's where I'm going to find those bulls. I went through that whole explanation because that's the core piece of what it takes to consistently find public land bull elk. So from that, from that foundation, then I start doing my desk scouting, what I call e-scouting, e-scouting. And we've done videos about this out on our YouTube channel. We're getting ready to do a whole nother series of them. There's a good chance I'll use this New Mexico elk tag as my e-scouting example. And the reason is that someplace far away, I'm not going to be able to get there this summer. I'm going to show up just before season starts and that's what I'm going to do, confirmation of what my desk scouting told me. I'm going to try to get there two days early and see what is going on on the ground, on the landscape. Because what if I'm looking at my satellite image on Onyx Maps and I see, okay, there's water here, there's water there. And I get there and it's a drought and all but one of those water tanks is dry. Guess what? 
my plan has to be adaptable and I need to adjust. And that's why those scouting days are really, really helpful. People often ask me, how many spots do you have on your map to start with? I try to have two spots for each day I'm going to be hunting. A morning spot and an evening spot. And in my scouting days, I'm going to go check out as many of those as possible. I'm not going to walk in there and stink it up. I'm mostly looking for tracks. I'm looking for any other type of sign, whether it's rubs, whether it's scat. Maybe I see some out because I'm glassing from afar. And once I look at as many of those places as I can, let's say I have two days to scout. After those two days of on-the-ground scouting, I reshuffle my priority. Uh, let's say I thought, okay, this was the best place. That's what my desk scouting told me. I show up because of drought, there's no water. Or I show up and there's a camp parked right on that water tank. I got to be able to reshuffle my priorities and I want to start out with my best place as possible. And over the course of my hunt, say I have 10 spots on my list, each day some of them are going to get checked off. Or by four or five days into the hunt, I might be working just one, two, three, at the most maybe four different spots. And the odds are they're all going to be pretty close together. They're, they might only be a mile apart. So that's how I do my, my desk scouting. And then I want to make sure that I give myself enough time. I can't always do it because sometimes we're just going from one hunt to another to another. And when we show up at the next hunt, season's already open. So my scouting days are almost my first two days of hunting are, are more scouting days than they are anything. So that's, uh, that's a lot of what we're going to be talking about in the next few months, because once you have that tag and we've been spending the last, I think 10 or 12 episodes talking about how to get a tag. Now that you've got the tag, how do you start your scouting? How do you get prepared? How do you show up and have a plan? I mean, getting the tag is great, but you really want to have a plan that gives you a likelihood of success when you get there. Oh, let's see. There's all kinds of them here. Colton Jackson said, I loved your podcast with Todd Orr. Thanks. <laughs> Todd's a great guy. And uh, that podcast, I listened to it again the other day. It's like, wow, can't imagine being attacked by a grizzly bear. Uh, here's one that's kind of related to this scouting. Because when you're looking at your scouting areas, you want to have a few things in proximity. You want to have water, you want to have feed, and you want to have bedding cover. Remember, in the archery season, my idea that sanctuary is always number one in the rifle seasons, that's not the case in archery season. Elk are a lot more accommodating of human traffic during the, the early, the pre-rut, and peak rut. Once you get past peak rut, yeah, they head out, and it's all about sanctuary and hiding. So... This person asks, how far will they travel to go from food to water? I've seen him go three, four miles at times. Uh, an elk can walk four or five miles an hour. So they will cover a lot of ground in short order. Don't overestimate how far they'll go from food to water to bedding in whatever category. And depending on the time of the year and depending on where you're at, like in the northern Rockies here, water's not that big of a deal. We got water in every drainage. Now, when I go to New Mexico or Arizona or Nevada or maybe Utah, some parts of Colorado, water is a huge deal. And it's going to be a, a part of what I'm using for my scouting. Then you get to some places where food is a much bigger deal. Again, in the northern Rockies, we have really, really good summer, what I call summer and, and early transition range. High on the mountains, lush, green, lots of food there. As quick as the elk start getting moved due to pressure and weather, all of a sudden things change up in the northern Rockies because it's more of an alpine type environment. You go to New Mexico or Arizona where it's mostly flat, not all, but it's canyons, it's rolling foothills. Most of the food is very similar across the landscape. So they're going to be more dispersed and can be more dispersed because the food isn't concentrating them in, say, November. Whereas in Montana, in November, they're pretty concentrated in certain areas because of where the food is and their sanctuary requirements. So I hope I'm explaining some of that. Uh, 
in a manner that makes some sense. Uh, oh, let's see. How many miles will elk travel in a day? What is their normal range? Uh, the answer to that, James, is there really is no what I'll call normal. Understand that every question, the answer is going to be different based on if you're talking early season, pre-rut, peak rut, post-rut, or late season. In late season, a bull elk won't go more than 300 yards in any direction. He's found his sanctuary, and that's where he's going to hang out until season's over. Now in the pre-rut, that same bull is out looking for cows. He's checking them. He's going from herd to herd, drainage to drainage, basin to basin. He might put on 12, 15 miles in a day making his loops. So it's really hard to answer that in a, in a general question of how far will they travel because it's so dependent upon the time of year and the situation. So, oh, let's see. Which tracking poles do I use? Bryce answered that. I use Leakey's or Lecky, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, man, it's moving by so fast. Have you thrown some on the document here, Michael? Yeah. All right. Here's what we're doing. Michael's got a Google Doc over there that's popping up on my computer. So he's trying to sort out the ones that are a little bit different than normal. Uh, what are my thoughts on drop camps? I get asked this a lot. Uh, a drop camp is you hire an outfitter or somebody, he'll load all your gear, he'll take you in there. It might even be his camp gear. It might even be his camp he has set up. He'll take you in there, drop you off, i.e. drop camp, and then he'll come back and get you in four or five days or a week or whatever. That's your hunt. You're out there doing it yourself at that point. Uh, I've not done a drop camp with an outfitter per se. Uh, I have friends who've done them. And part of it is how much pressure does it get? You know, is he bringing a new group in there every five or six days? That place might get quite a bit of pressure. Or does he rotate them and let one rest? Uh, I would ask him a lot of questions about that because that's probably going to determine how much success in what you're going to see. So, uh, let's see. The Southwest is in a terrible drought. E-scout accordingly. That is a very good comment. Uh, you, if you think about, because today we're going to probably talk a lot about New Mexico. Everybody's so excited or so depressed, one way or the other. If you drew New Mexico or you didn't, uh, you're, you fall into the excited camp or the depressed camp. But the, the drought in the southwest right now is really bad. They didn't have much moisture this winter. And they actually last year, starting in the monsoon season, in the states of, I'll say, Arizona, New Mexico, somewhat southwest Colorado, uh, southern Utah, and Nevada. You get this monsoonal flow that comes up, and you get a lot of thunderstorms. A lot of their precipitation happens in July, August, and September. Well, last July, August, and September was a very weak monsoon season, so they came into the winter with low moisture. They didn't get much moisture this winter. We need some moisture down in those states to really help out. It, it's, it's just one of the things you need to be keeping your pulse on. You can go out and look at the U.S. Drought Monitor, and it will tell you it's a map of each state, and it has ratings of what degree of drought it is. Uh, the other place, if you go to GoHunt.com, they have precipitation charts for every unit in the West. That's another place. I, I, I look at those precipitation charts all the time. They keep them updated. And it will show you what the normal cycle is, what it's, I think they've got the last three years out there. So, uh, drought in the Southwest, definitely going to be an issue you want to think about. Um, just like up North, like Montana, we've had our worst unit, worst winter in many, many years. You want to think about that also. How's that affecting elk numbers? It's certainly affecting deer and antelope numbers. Uh, <sighs> Do you have more success hunting peak rut or post rut, and why do you think one would be better than the other? Not even a question. Uh, peak rut. Post rut is the hardest time to kill an elk. I don't care. There's a, re uh, there's a reason all the states plant their rifle seasons in the post rut. If you are consistently harvesting bull elk on public land in the post rut, 
you have got it dialed in. It's just that tough. Now you back up to, to peak rut or pre-rut. I still would rather hunt peak rut. A lot of people say, well, the big bulls already have their cows. It's hard to get in on them, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it is. But man, they're vocal and they're active and there's all kinds of stuff going on. It's harder to kill a big bull that time of the season, but it's way more fun. The pre-rut, they're still a little bit quiet. They're trying to let the little guys herd up the cows and then they come in there and take them away from them. So most people will say your chance of shooting a really big public land bull in archery season, your best is in the pre-rut. Uh, I, I would agree that's probably the case, but uh, I <laughs> I just like hunting the, the peak rut. So uh, then let's not forget, hunting is about fun, right? And uh, do what's fun. So someone asked, did you draw New Mexico? Yes, I did. I drew my second choice. Uh, I drew an early season archery tag. Uh, that's the second time in three years I've drawn archery elk in New Mexico. I know people hate me. Everyone complains I'm so lucky in New Mexico, and I am. I have been so lucky in New Mexico for elk and antelope. Uh, but if it's any consolation, I apply in Idaho every year. I've been applying for 20 some years and I usually apply for units that have draw odds of 15, 20% or better. And I can't draw a tag there. So I guess one balances out the other. Uh, let's see. Someone says they drew the second archery season in New Mexico. I've never been that far south. What kind of vegetation should a guy look for? You better get scouting is all I can say because depending on the unit you drew, if you are in one of the units in northern New Mexico, you're going to be in aspens, you're going to be in fir, dark timber. You'd swear you were in, in central Colorado at 12,000 feet. If you drew one of the areas in southern New Mexico or southwest New Mexico, it's going to be mostly ponderosa and pinyon juniper and grasslands. It, we're talking huge diversity. So... Do your research. I mean, it, you, when you draw these tags, you owe it to yourself and you owe it to the hunt to really do as much research as possible. Um, you're gonna you're gonna see a huge amount of diversity in in vegetation in all those states that I talk about: New Mexico, Arizona. You know, people have this mindset that New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada is all drought, all like desert. Well, you get up to their places and they have plenty of mountains there over 10,000 feet. You're going to see yellow aspens in archery season. Yeah, you're going to swear you're in Colorado. So a lot of diversity in those places and the elk will respond differently based on what season you have and, and what unit you have. So, oh, uh, let's see. <laughs> While I'm e-scouting on digital like Google Earth or Onyx or with paper maps, how do I find feed wallows and bedding? You're gonna have to get really handy with the, the aerial views. Uh, paper maps aren't gonna do you much good when you're looking for feed, wallows, or bedding. It might help you for roads and trails and the topo lines might help you with uh, you know what the slope of the mountain is and stuff, but I would get, I'd go and get Onyx. Onyx has, you can have the, there's three down in the lower right, you can say, I want topo. You click the next button, say, oh, show it to me in satellite. Okay, click a different button, show it to me in what they call hybrid, which is a satellite image with all the topo lines. And they have all the things you need to know. I, now that I use it, I can't imagine trying to do my scouting without Onyx maps. It just, the way it is so to, but to answer your question you're gonna have a really hard time finding those things with just paper maps or with just Google Earth I would go get something that's a little more detailed than Google Earth if you look at it here's here's one helpful hint I'll tell you in the southern states and some of you are gonna hate me for saying this but <laughs> if you look at an aerial map say in Arizona or New Mexico or wherever you, you ever looked at a bicycle tire laying on the ground from up above, say it's laying on its side? You see a hub in the middle and then you see all these spokes going out from it? Once you get good at looking at aerial maps, you'll be able to identify every water source because you'll see all these cattle trails 
coming into the water sources. And in those really arid states, elk use those water sources. So when you look at my maps that I save on my, uh, my phone, my, uh, right here, you will see so many pins of little things about water sources. And no, nothing I know of has as good of detail about water sources as on X. That's why, that's another big reason why I use it, so. Uh, how do I know if another hunter is bugling or if it's a bull? <clears throat> uh, <laughs> it, you, over time, you kind of get the hang of it. You, you, uh, a real bull is going to, your body's going to feel it. I, I mean, just the vibration and the woods, you're going to feel it. A lot of calls, especially the calls with the built-in reeds in them, are going to sound very tinny, very plasticky. Especially if you're, you know, more than about 100 yards away. It's like, hmm, I know what that is. That's a whatever call. Uh, so you can kind of tell oh, once you get the hang of it, um, and you'll know if you call them in, <laughs> or you'll know if you walk in on them, one or the other. Uh, does shed hunting give you any scouting value? Uh, in my mind, no. And the reason being is when elk are shedding in late March, early April, they're on the winter range. There's very little hunting activity and very few places where elk are going to be on the winter range during hunting seasons. Now, I say that mostly about alpine environments because there's a large migration from high country to low country, from low country back up to high country. You get to places where it's more pinion juniper flat country like maybe you'd see in Arizona or New Mexico. There, maybe the answer would be yes, it might help some because they're not doing a big migration up a mountain or down a mountain. They're just dispersing and moving across the landscape in a general way based on food and water availability. So in states that don't have a big alpine situation, I would say maybe it has value, but in most of the Rockies, the answer would be no. Hmm. Archery season in Colorado. How long would I sit on a water hole before moving off? I sit, sit a water hole every day from about mm, 10 to 11 in the morning until about 4 to 5 in the afternoon. If I got to take a nap, if nothing comes in, nothing comes in. But it beats going back to camp. And here's why. Especially later in the season, in the peak rut, in places where water can be a factor. The bull is going to have his cows, and he's going to push them and push them to a bedding area. And on the way to the bedding area, just about always, they stop and get water right at daylight, and then they move on to the bedding area. Now, sometimes that'll be somewhere up a slope. It might be on a north side or an east side where there's some shade. Usually that bull is so active when the temperature is warm that sometime in the middle of the day, he will come down all by himself, completely silent, and he will get a drink because he can't drink enough water to sustain himself in that period of time by just getting a drink in the morning or a drink at night. So it's a very effective tactic if you have the patience to do it. But he might have four different water sources near where he's bedded his cows, so you got a one in four chance that that's the one he comes into. And he's not going to do it every day. But on the days when he's thirsty, expect a lot of bulls to come in in midday. I'm talking like from noon to 2 o'clock. I don't know how many times I've walked by or glassed from afar. I've even driven by water holes at 1 in the afternoon. And here a six-point bull goes running out of there because he came down to get his drink in the middle of the day. He, <laughs> all I can figure is they know that most of, most of us hunters are back at camp taking a nap. Not me. Uh, boy, boy, there's a lot of questions here, Michael, which is good stuff. Corey always talks about the advantage of hunting the pre-rut. Other than food and water, other than food and water and cows, are you prioritizing areas with a lot of other sign, rubbing, etc., when you get boots on the ground? Uh, yeah. If I see a bunch of fresh rubs, I'll definitely make note of that. But I'm primarily looking at tracks. 
uh, I'm out at night. Uh, I mean, if you don't see this footage because at nighttime the footage is terrible. It's all grainy, right? You ever seen nighttime footage? It, it looks like Blair Witch Project. We spend a lot of time out at night after dinner listening. Just hiking or driving or whatever. We find an old road. Well, maybe it's gated. We'll just walk in that road. Yeah, we're not up bushwhacking in the dark, but we're going places where we can hear and say, all right, there are bulls working that basin tonight. They're going to be in there in the morning. So there's a lot of things that go into that scouting, but if it's visual that you're asking, I'm mostly looking for track, scat, and rub. And if I see them, all the better. Mm -hmm. A lot of full moon questions. Uh, and part of that is is because this year the full moon, if you look at the calendar, is going to fall right in the peak of the rut. Uh, for me, I don't, I don't really care. I uh, and I say that because I have to hunt whether it's a full moon, new moon, quarter moon, a half moon. It doesn't matter. I just got to be there. I, I got hunts I got to go to, so I just hunt through it. And I've concluded that I don't think the moon phase changes the rut at all it might change the activity level of the elk of okay it's a full moon and it was hot they're up more during the night they feel more comfortable they can see better but i've heard people say oh the full moon turns off the rut now if you think about it elk have a set gestation period they have to drop those calves somewhere in late may and early june you back that up they have to do their breeding sometime between about September 6th or 7th to October 6th or 7th. If they're going to drop those calves in that period and they don't care whether it's full moon, new moon, whatever, that's what they're going to do. And that's why all the research says it's more of a photo period effect. In other words, how much daylight there is each day that de determines where they are in their, their breeding cycle. Uh, with all the timber in the mountains, what do you recognize that would be a bedding area? Uh, a lot of things. Uh, where to start? Bedding areas, as a general rule, are going to be away from motors. When I say when I say roads and trails, I mean motorized mo roads and trails. And bedding areas, they even want to be away from foot trails. They usually aren't going to bed right near a foot trail. So that's kind of the first thing for a bedding area. And then, depending on what, again, what season of the year it is, if it's November, their bedding area is going to be right next to their sanctuary. It's going to be their sanctuary. And they're just going to go out on the edge of this 20-acre patch of timber, and they're going to go feed right there at night, and they're going to come back and bed. So what's a bedding area in a late season period in November is a way different thing than a bedding area, say, September 20th, when it's a peak rut. So... It, it, a lot of it depends, but you're, it's going to be how much proximity or what is the proximity of the things they need with the least amount of risk to humans. That, I, I know that is a generic answer, but that's really what the answer is. On September 20th, they're going to bed someplace close to food and close to water and probably somewhere where they feel comfortable that they're far enough away from roads and trails. Now understand, when I talk about sanctuary, that is very important in post-rut and late season. It's not nearly as important in the pre-rut and peak rut. It's crazy the places I have seen bull elk pushing cows around in the peak rut. I mean, I've seen them pushing them across state highways. I've seen them where there's all kinds of traffic. But that same bull, you are going to find him nowhere near those spots once rifle season comes. So don't, don't mix up, again, the, the priority need that these elk have in the time, that, time of year that you're hunting them. Oh, what are some things to look for on site while summer scouting in the Colorado Rockies? I wouldn't bother. Unless you live in Colorado and it's in your backyard, I wouldn't bother. And a lot of people think I'm crazy when I say that. Think about this. Okay, you have a an October elk tag for whatever unit in Colorado. You go there in July, and the elk are up at 13,000 feet. 
because that's where the best feed is, that's where the best water is, and that's where the least amount of mountain bikers, motor bikers, roads, cars, that's where they're going to be in July. All right? Come October, they already had, say, 10 inches of snow. It snowed three times. The temperatures are below zero or below freezing. The vegetation is, has dried up. There's already been an archery season, a muzzleloader season. Guess what? Where you saw them in July, they're going to be in a completely different place in your October season. So I say go as close to your hunting season as you possibly can. If you want to go there in July and have a hike and have a great time, that's good. But don't kid yourself. Don't get yourself on the wrong track that because you walked up to 13,000 feet and you saw a herd of elk up there, bachelor group of bulls in the velvet, they're up there letting the wind blow the flies off their antlers. They are not going to be there in October. It'll give you a feel for what the trailheads are, what the road systems are, what roads are open and closed, which have motorized travel, non-motorized travel. But as far as scouting for elk, uh, summer scouting can, well, it's more relevant to the early season of August, possibly the pre-rut season. But anything beyond that, you're probably going to be wasting your time. Save those days, go fishing with a family, and maybe squeak one or two of those days away to do your scouting before the, the one or two days before your season starts. <clears throat> Let's see, how does your hunting tactic change throughout the rutting season from pre-rut to post-rut? Or do you stay with the same game plan? I stay with the same game plan. I have my my map, my, my Onyx. I've got my list of, all right, here's what I think is the best spot, the second best spot, the third best spot. And I just keep cycling through those, throwing some of them in the trash. All right, I'm to the end of my hunt. I've got three days left. I've got three spots I know that are really good. That's the ones I'm going to work. I, I can't say that I really change my tactic much, but I might change how aggressive I am with those tactics. And the reason is, is towards the end of the hunt, if I blow some elk out, guess what? I, I don't have more days to come back and hunt them, so I'm probably going to push that basin pretty hard on the third day. And if I blow them out, I blow them out. I'm going to go to one of my other two or three or four basins, and I'll hunt one of those the remaining two days. So I, I'm probably more aggressive, but my tactics stay the same. Uh, let's see. Someone asked what Leupold binoculars I'm using right now. Uh, I've been using the new BX5 10x42s. And I, I was talking to Leupold last week down in Boise, at the Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Rendezvous. And I said, when are those going to be out? Because I've been telling people about them. They said, oh, you can talk about them now. I've been using them. Uh, we get prototypes that we get to use. So uh, I think they're going to be out in May. The new BX5 10 by 42 I think there's going to be an 8 by 42 also. Uh, that's what I've been using. Uh, before that, I was using the BX4 uh, Pro Guide HD. Both of these are HDs. And... Uh, You'll really, really like them. Trust me on that one. They're very, very good binocular. Oh, uh, let's see. You would love to know how I store all that meat that we get from all of our hunts. Well, Michael over here, he stores some of it. Marcus uh, down the street, he stores some of it. We usually have some guest hunters. Uh, we have family. We have friends. We share a lot of it. Uh, and I have... Two freezers in my garage, and I have another freezer out in my shop. And then in my house, I have the freezer above the refrigerator. So uh, between all of us, we have the capacity to store a lot. And we got a lot of friends who, who like wild game in addition to how much of it we eat ourselves. In fact, right now, tonight, I just took out some uh, moose meat. I, Michael, you got any moose burger left? Yeah, I actually had moose tacos today. Oh, Michael had moose tacos for lunch today. I'm like running out of moose burger. I'm, <laughs> I'm hoping one of us draw a moose tag this year. I have, I, I just can't get enough of that stuff. All right, this is a question that it depends on the state. The person says, "What's the best advice for a person with phys physical ailments to get a bull elk?" Uh, first of all, I'd find some good friends. Or I'd maybe find an outfitter who's who's capable at doing that. And don't feel at all bashful about 
getting help from anyone, uh, whether it's an outfitter or whether it's family and friends. The other thing is look at certain states that have special hunts for what I call mobility impaired. New Mexico, the, the deadline was last month and the, the results came out today. But for next year, apply in New Mexico if you have a mobility impairment. The best mobility impaired elk tags in the West, hands down, not even a question, are in New Mexico. They give the mobility impaired hunters a season ahead of the regular rifle seasons. They let you use a firearm, either a muzzle loader or a rifle, depending on the unit. They, they, and they, they move it ahead so you're still hunting elk in the rut. And they give these hunts in some of their absolute best elk units. There, there's no state that's doing more for mobility impaired hunters than New Mexico. So that's, that's where I'd look and, and what I'd think about. Oh, let's see. What are an elk's needs during the first rifle period of south, southwest Colorado, October 13th through the 17th? So there you're transitioning from the peak rut to post rut. In fact, you're probably in full-blown post rut. The first day or two of season, you might hear a little bit of bugling, but in that period, a public land bull elk, his number one need is sanctuary. He wants to get away from people. There might be some young bulls still hanging out with the cows, but the old bulls, the mature bulls, have seen this movie before. They know how it ends. They understand, just like Pete didn't. Last year, they watched Pete stand out there in the wide open and get shot opening morning. They're like, I don't, don't be like Pete. So they end up going to sanctuary areas. The number one need in post rut and late season for bull elk on public land is sanctuary, sanctuary. In fact, not the number one need, the number, the top 10 needs are sanctuary. After that will come some food and water. Breeding, forget about it. They're done, they've had it. You know, in some places where maybe tags are very limited or there's no hunting pressure because of access like private lands or whatever, yeah, then maybe that rut activity and, and the stuff will stretch to a longer period. But if you're talking southwest Colorado, uh, up in the San Juans or up in that area, uh, sanctuary is going to be their primary need at that time of year. Uh, let's see. Boy, there's a bunch of them here. When do we get to see the llamas again? Oh, man, you're going to see a ton of llamas. Any of you who were at BHA Rendezvous last week got to see a lot of llamas. Uh, Bo Beatty from uh, Wilderness Ridge Trail Llamas, who we get our llamas from, uh, he was there. He had a little seven-day-old llama, and they auctioned off the naming rights for it. And to support conservation, the guys at Go Hunt bought the naming rights, and they named him Pancake. But the other big thing that happened there is Leupold announced that they have a llama that they've kind of, they've worked with Bo, uh, Bo Beatty. And this llama is called Marcus because of the founder of Leupold is Marcus Leupold. And that llama, Marcus, is going with me everywhere we go this year. Any place that's a backcountry hunt, Marcus, Marshall, Oliver, and I'm not sure which other ones are coming with us. So you're going to see lots and lots of llama stuff this year. Oh, this is a good one. I talked to a bunch of people last week in Boise about this one. Can you give some practical tips and procedures to go through in order to bear proof your camp? So I'm going to talk about bear proofing your camp in grizzly country, okay? And these same principles apply in black, black bear country. But in grizzly country, don't screw around with it for two reasons. One, your own safety. The other reason is once a bear, one, it, most of the grizzly bears that have to get removed or culled from the population for being problem bears are because of poor food storage, poor dirty camp behavior by people out in the woods. And we're trying to recover grizzly bears. We want them delisted. We're there. You owe it to yourself, your own personal safety, but to the bears also to keep a clean camp and keep it that way. And here's what we do. Very first thing, store your food in a dry bag or in something else two to 300 yards away from your camp, okay? And don't put your food 
upwind of your camp because if the bear smells it, he's going to come from downwind. He's going to walk right through your camp. Do it the other way. If you know that the prevailing wind comes out of the west, put your, your food storage to the east of your camp. And you'll, we've done videos on this out on our YouTube channel. What we do is we have a really big dry bag and a whole lot of rope. And we find a, a place where we can hang that at least 15 feet off the ground. And we hang it about, I don't know, 8 or 10 feet away from the trunk of the tree. And what goes in there is all of our food. All of our garbage, all of our trash, all of our snacks, anything. Nothing food related comes back to our camp. We eat over near where our food storage is. Once we're done, we take all of our dishes, all of, anything that has a food smell to it, it goes over to our food storage and it goes in either the food bag or sometimes we have a different bag just for trash and disposables. That's the number one thing about how to keep bears out of your camp is just don't do anything that attracts them. And then the other part is, say you shoot an animal. Again, we do the same thing. We will hang that animal far away from our camp, two, three hundred yards. And what we'll try to do is try to hang it. Say there's a grove of trees, and if you can, if there's an opening, try to find a way that you can approach that meat with some good visibility. Don't hang it down in a bottom somewhere where you got to climb down in there and if there's a bear there, it's like five yards away and you got a problem. Hang it someplace where the wind can blow on it, but yet there's still some trees for shade. And give it the, a place where you can glass with your binos. You can see if the meat's been disturbed, has a game bag been pulled down, whatever. That's, that's the way that we bear-proof our camp. Uh, I think this year we're probably going to do more videos on it in a more, what I'll call, relevant manner. Uh, right while we're out there doing it, we're going to show people this is what we're doing and this is why we're doing it. Uh, a fed bear is a dead bear. Just remember that. Oh, gosh. How many days do you give yourself for an out-of-state hunt when you're not pressed for time? Uh, you know, when I used to not have to go from one hunt to the other to the other to the other, I'd try to give myself six to seven days of hunting and two to three days of scouting. That's what I'd try to do. I can't say it always works. And, you know, a lot of people have jobs, vacation is, is tight. Uh, they got other commitments with family, with work, with whatever. So uh, not everybody can always have that many days to go do it. And in some of these places, the season dates are only five days long. So... If I got a five-day season, I'm, I know I want three days of scouting, if at all possible. Because I, five days, you know, if, if, if you weren't on my schedule and you only had the five days, I'm accustomed to it because we only give ourselves five days regardless of how long the season is. But if I only had five days and this was my one hunt of the year, I would get there in time to have three full days of scouting. And I would hopefully find that bull and... I'd just pattern him, pattern him, and opening morning, at least in rifle season, I'd try to kill him opening morning. And if it was archery season, well, I'd try to put myself right in his wheelhouse opening morning. A little bit easier to do in rifle season. So, Oh, gosh, my goodness, there are so many great questions. I like this, folks. You, you guys are uh, really asking really good questions today. Uh, I think I think we're going to have some good stuff from this one. Uh, <laughs> uh, do I prefer one airline over another? Any TSA secret guidelines I need to know? I drew a New Mexico rifle hunt. So th this is probably a good question because you're, you're, it sounds like you're going to fly. We did a video on flying with firearms. It's out on our YouTube channel. And when you go out there and watch it, go read the comments. Because I talked to Delta Airlines, which is the primary airline I fly out of Bozeman. I talked to TSA. And here's what they say you do in, in, in our, at our airport with Delta and TSA. You have to have your ammunition in a factory box. They will not accept the hand loader's plastic box. 
They say you need a factory box to keep your ammo in. And then you take your ammo and you put it in your gun case along with your firearm with the bolt removed. That's how they say to do it here. And that's how I've done it in most other airports I've flown out of. Uh, fly in and out of Petersburg, Alaska a lot. Uh, fly in and out of Grand Junction, Colorado a lot. Now, a lot of those comments said, that's not how you do it. They, I mean, they lit me up. Well, evidently their airline or TSA in their airport has a different policy. Uh, they say, no, you got to carry your ammo as checked luggage. You got to this, you got that. Okay, I get it. But the point is, don't show up at the airport assuming anything. Call the airline, call your airport. Don't call TSA's 1-800 number. Even if that means you got to drive down there and you, you got to walk up to the counter and talk to somebody. Find out what their policy is. The number of people I have seen who had to give up ammo at the counter is amazing because they didn't have it in a factory box or they didn't have some other way to do it. And then the, the new rule at TSA is, and I found this out the hard way, is if you have four lock slots on your, your locking rifle case, you need a lock in all four of those slots. I used to just put a lock in two of them and call it good. All of a sudden, some new TSA person says, that's not going to work. you got to go down here to the store and buy two more locks because you got four slots for locks. We need a lock in every slot. Find that out also before you fly. <laughs> it's, uh, it's frustrating to find those things out at the last minute. So, but... <clears throat> uh, So right here, you'll see one guy says, Randy, I fly the same airline as you do, and they absolutely take reloading plastic boxes every time. And that's what their regulations actually say. If you ran over a counter check that said otherwise, he was running with his own without a net, and he is wrong. Well, I've had it happen in Montana. I've had it happen in Colorado, and I saw it happen in Topeka, Kansas. So there's multiple people out there then they got the wrong memo. I, I'm not saying that this is incorrect. I'm just saying... You can argue that with the TSA person, but you're going to lose the argument. <laughs> you are, your flight's going to leave before you win that argument. It's just how it is. So for me, I just call in advance, take care of it, and usually I, I don't have any problem. So, oh, yeah, someone says, thank you to all these sponsors who make this possible. Yeah, thanks for saying that. Uh, because, uh, again, I want to remind everybody, and I hope when you go out and do your uh, buying of equipment, you'll think about these companies because they're saying, go do this, provide everything, make it free of charge. And, again, twice every, every uh, episode we try to make sure people know who they are. And it's Botech Archery. Go out to BotechArchery.com and sign up for that new your choice, they call it, the, the bow of your choice. Go out there and sign up for it. Uh, it's open right now. Uh, Leupold Optics, Onyx Maps. Again, remember if you buy app products, use promo code Randy to save 20%. Tight Spot Quivers, Ripcord Arrow Rest, Black Gold Sights, GoHunt.com. Again, sign up for their Insider and get $50 of free store credit by using promo code Randy. And Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. Uh, Michael and I were just talking with all of the, the elk tags we have this year. They're leaning more towards the archery season. We've got me and my uncle drew archery in New Mexico. I've got Montana archery. Michael's got Montana archery. Marcus, Marcus has Montana archery. We're going to be doing a lot of bugling and calling, Michael. Right. Michael's over there. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the companies that make it possible. Uh, and I hope that you'll find us on our other po uh, platforms, our podcast. You can get it on iTunes or Stitcher. It's called the Hunt Talk Radio, uh, Leupold's Hunt Talk Radio. Uh, our YouTube channel is Randy Newberg Hunter. Randy Newberg Hunter. <laughs> Did I say that right? Can't even say my own name right now. Uh, and then we have Leupold's Fresh Tracks with Randy Newberg out on Amazon Prime. And... Uh, I, I am so frustrated right now because we've had episodes out there waiting to be approved, and you just never know when Amazon's going to get to them. 
but we're trying our hardest. Um, that's probably the most common question I get anymore. When are you going to get new episodes out on Amazon? Uh, for those of you who've been doing it out on Amazon, oh man, thanks a ton. I cannot believe how many people go to Amazon and watch our content. That's so good for us. I appreciate it so much. Uh, Josh says, if you could pick any week in September to archery hunt Montana, what week would you choose and why? I would pick uh, September 10th through the 17th. That just, it, I, there's no science to it. It's just where I've had my best luck. Uh, some people would say, no, you should take the 17th through the 25th. I'm not going to argue that would be a good choice also. You just, you know, that, that someone asked my opinion and... That's my opinion of when I have the best luck of, of running into elk, getting responses uh, here in Montana. Oh, let's see. Mike Crofts asks, where do you go for the bow of your choice entry? Go to bowtecharchery.com. Oh, boy, we have got a ton of good stuff. I'm, I'm liking this, Michael. We, we need more of this. Uh... What distance from roads or four-wheeler trails do you get before you even start hunting? Uh, it, it's not a function of distance. A lot of it is also steepness of terrain and topography. I, I, I've said it many times. There's a place I hunt in Colorado that I can hear car doors slamming. I can hear people talking. But it's so steep once you leave the trailhead that everybody goes the other direction. I go the opposite direction, and I climb up this really steep face. I gain probably five to 600 feet of elevation really quickly, and when I get there, there's this huge mesa. And we've shot bull elk there when we could hear people down at the trailhead. So it's not necessarily a distance. It's what, what topography gives them comfort that this is a sanctuary. If it's all flat, easy going on the ground, I usually don't even start get serious until I'm at least a mile from roads or motorized trails. But that's, you know, like, like everything in life, there's the general rule and then there's the exceptions to the general rule. So, oh gosh, there are a lot of them here. Randy, can we get some tips on how to use our Rocky Mountain elk calls? Uh, you know what, Rocky Jacobson, uh, the founder of the company, and Corey Jacobson, 10-time world champion caller, would be the best guys to do that. They both use their calls. Uh, Corey has elk101.com. Uh, he's got tons of good calling stuff. He and I talked today. He's he's trying to get more content up there, <laughs> and his servers crashed today. I shouldn't laugh at his expense, but I've been there and done that. I know what he's going through. But my point, my point of pointing you to their direction is those guys are experts. Rocky, he's he's the guy who builds and designs these calls that win all these calling contests. Those guys got it dialed in. Uh, their videos are are as good as anything you're going to find about elk calling. Oh, let's see. I think this might be the last one, but maybe we'll come up with another one. What are the best states for the non-resident youth? Well, uh, I think I've said this before, is that as far as youth hunts, the actual hunts themselves, New Mexico is hard to beat. It's kind of like the mobility impaired hunts. They give the kids a, a period of time that's in front of the regular hunting. They put them in good units. The downside is the odds are really, really bad. The other option that I would strongly consider is put kids in, buy a youth license in Arizona. It's really, really cheap to buy the non-resident youth license. And build points for them for all species, particularly elk, antelope, deer, and bighorn sheep. And by the time they get, say, you can start doing it, I think, at age 10 in Arizona, if I remember right, because my son, let's do the math. My son has 17 points. He's 27. So I think it's age 10. So building those points in Arizona, within five or six years, by the time they're 16, 17, they're going to have enough points. They're going to be able to go on a really good deer hunt and one of those late season elk hunts. So I, I really like what Arizona does for the youth. It's, it's really, really good. 
And with that, I guess, Michael, in our world, what do we call this? It's a wrap. Yeah, it's a wrap, as they say. So one point, folks, next week I have to be gone, and these guys are going turkey hunting in Nebraska. So we're going to miss next week. The next time we hit Elk Talk Live is going to be two weeks from tonight, which, what would that be? May 2nd, something like that? Something like that. Yeah, May 2nd. So anyhow, thanks for watching. Thanks for following along. Appreciate all your support. Hope you draw your tags.